Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Betsy Sutter. Good afternoon. Welcome. I hope you're all having an absolutely terrific VMworld 2017. I know that I am. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be here today. Uh, my name is Betsy Sutter. I am the Chief People Officer at VMware, and um, I couldn't be more thrilled at being here this afternoon at this moment um, to host a session that is devoted, devoted to a topic such as the one as we're going to discuss today. The value of increasing diversity in businesses is critical, I think, to the future of many businesses' successes, if not all. So today you're going to hear a diverse set of perspectives from people who are actually in the arena, people who are actually working, tackling, and talking about the challenges that affect our industry. VMware's journey formally became, uh, or put into motion formally about three years ago, when we knew that diversity and inclusion would be a business imperative. And so we set out to think about how we could do this, how we could impact cultural and systemic change within our own business so that we would have more diversity and inclusion. And you may have recalled, some of you might recall, that two years ago in the tech industry, a lot of companies were put under a lot of pressure to release their female representation numbers. And while VMware was not hesitant about releasing those numbers, we knew that the real need was in taking action. And so what we did is we built action plans that are business-led, that are business imperatives, that are business priorities. So it's not an initiative or a strategy that is at the edge of the business. It's a business strategy and imperative that we've built into the core of our business. So our business leaders actually have action plans and priorities and scorecards that we measure on a regular basis as part of our operating plan, and they actually go to the VMware board. Now, progress is good. We know uh, this kind of change is slow and takes time, but we know that we're on the right track. The one thing that I can say as an executive sponsor of this initiative, along with the CEO of VMware, Pat Gelsinger, is that we're wholeheartedly committed to disrupting and making change in this space, not only at VMware, but for the entire industry. So with that, speaking of someone who's committed and disruptive and making change, it is my pleasure to have a colleague in Dirk Hondel, our VP, and Chief Open Source Officer to introduce to you, to introduce to our next guest, Dirk. Thank you, Betsy. You're welcome. So as Betsy said, this is all about diversity and inclusion, so we included a token white guy. Um, <laughs> I, I have a small team at VMware working on open source. And I'm relatively proud to say, actually I'm very proud to say, that I currently have 50% women and 30% non-white employees. <laughs> to me, this has become a topic that I care very deeply about. And to me, it's all about the women who shine, the women who make a difference, and showcasing them and making sure that other women see them as a role model. So I'm very, very pleased to introduce our speaker, which is Nithya Ruff, a good friend of mine. I first met her um, about six, seven years ago as part of the Yocta project, an open source project that I ran at my previous company. And she was, from the beginning, engaged in understanding the community, engaging with the engineers, engaging with the customer, being a, a center of this community of this development, of making this something that included more than just the few people who started that, but that would grow, that would become something special. Since then, Nithya has moved on. She's at Comcast in, in a similar role to mine, actually. And she and I share a board seat, share board seats at the Linux Foundation, where she has been very active in, in bringing up the topics of diversity, diversity and inclusion. So with no further ado, Nithya. Thank you so much, Dirk. Thank you, Dirk. 
So Dirk is what I call an ally, a sponsor, a champion, someone who um, unashamedly supports people and helps them achieve their goals and you know, helps them uh, get opportunities like this. And, and I want to say that it's my pleasure and privilege to be here. And I thank Dirk for inviting me to VM World this year to speak on this topic that's very near and dear to my heart. I also want to thank Betsy, I want to thank Suzanne, I want to thank the, thank the te team who put together VMworld because I love the images that VMworld has across the arena, um, this, this diverse set of images of people who are shaping tech. And I particularly chose this one uh, for my uh, slides because I thought that this is such a vision of uh, you know, the, the collective group of us, men, women, of all colors and shapes and sizes, will shape tech in the future. So let me um, go on to talking about my topic, um, which is where are we in open source and in, in diversity? So I'll skip the disclaimer. And, and I thought it would be good to say, are we there yet? As a little kid, I remember when my parents took me on trips, I would always say, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? And, and so hopefully by the end of this discussion, you'll understand whether we are there yet or not and what's holding us back and how we can uh, collectively push forward and move the needle. To introduce myself uh, and tell you my story. So my story starts really in India. I was born in India and then I was first introduced to computer science, by the way, at the graduate level at the age of 20. So I had not been exposed to computers before the age of 20, and I did my master's in computer science at the age of 20. Um, and if I can do it, I feel lots of our others can do it. And then from there in 1998 at Silicon Graphics, I got to start working on open source. And open source was becoming quite prevalent and companies were beginning to look at uh, what, how should we use this in our uh, product strategy, how should we use, uh, work with communities, how should we uh, articulate the value that we bring to open source as companies and how do we work you know, across community and companies. So it was a really fantastic experience for me and I had many mentors there, people like Jeremy Ellison who's a, a, a maintainer of the Samba project and then Bov Rolek and you know, no, numerous others. That opportunity then got me a chance to lead the product strategy at Tripwire, where we started uh, tripwire.org. We had a chance to open source Tripwire uh, and really build a community around uh, our product. And that led me to Wind River Systems, where I led the team to do the embedded Linux distribution. And here's a company which had a very successful proprietary product, but saw the trend that was happening in open source and started creating an open source distribution, embedded distribution. And that's where I got to work with Dirk on the Octo project and with the Linux Foundation and then the Intel open source technology uh, office. But really, I'm very, very proud of two things. Um, at Western Digital, as well as Comcast, uh, I lead the open source office, and I started the open source office at Western Digital. One of the wonderful things about being a leader of the open source office, as Dirk will say, it's, it's, it's really a culture change and a change agent function, right? Because you are uh, bringing together uh, developers, you're advocating for them with legal, with the community, with communities outside the company and changing the perception of the company with people who work with the company. And Dirk and, and the VMware open source office has done a spectacular job of really being on the map from an open source perspective from nothing. I mean, uh, VMware of course has done a lot of open source as a company, but, but really it's now front and center and I think that's, that's terrific. At the Linux Foundation, I get to advocate for women in technology, and I call it opening doors to open source, uh, which really has a poetic ring to it, and, and that's what I've uh, been focusing on. I also sit on a board uh, of a, an organization called Code Chicks, which was actually started by a VMware woman, Rupa Dasher, and it's been a privilege to work with Rupa and look at retention of women in technology and in engineering. So as you can see, my passions really are culture change, whether it's uh, including people into technology or changing how we work with open source, and uh, it's, it's been shaped over the years. 
So Betsy, I think, kicked it off really well and, and talked about why is it that diversity is important in technology and that it should be front and center and it should be driven by business strategy and not uh, on the periphery or on the edge. Frankly, the reason is, as, as the conference has told me also with the last three days, Every industry, every part of our world is being touched by software, is being touched by technology, is being touched by uh, the uh, you know, transformation that's happening, digital transformation. And much of this transformation is being driven by software. And a lot of the software transformation is being created the open source way, uh, whether it is in the cloud or in the IoT space. And, and this creates a tremendous amount of talent shortage. And this talent shortage cannot be addressed with the talent that we have today alone. We really need to open our doors to people of all kinds and take advantage of the talent and the diversity and the differences that they bring to the table. And we have to work on attracting, retaining, and developing talent as companies. It's an imperative. It's a must for shaping the future of technology. And when you look at um, what technology achieves, um, inclusion to me means that we are innovative because it brings cognitive diversity, it brings diversity of perspectives, which are shaped by different lifestyles, different people, different places that we all grow up in and the kind of uh, life that we are shaped by. Diversity also requires intention, as Betsy indicated. It does not happen by accident. Leaders of companies have to embrace it and have to build it into the business strategy in order to make it happen. And to be honest, uh, there is a very strong case, business case for inclusion. And it's been explained many times of the fact that we need to reflect our customer base. We need to reflect how the population looks. We need to be innovative and creative and we need to really engage all of the people in our companies in order to be truly innovative and productive. So we've all seen a tremendous amount of investment in technology and in diversity in tech uh, over the years. Uh, Intel famously made a statement, Brian Krasinich made a statement uh, at CES, I believe it was three or four years ago, that they will invest 300 million in uh, the diversity initiatives. And this year, I was very, very happy to hear Brian say that they're pulling in their goals from 2020 to 2018. I think that's fantastic. He said it's because they've made so much progress as a company. And I think he said two things in that statement that I particularly liked. One, he said we are doing it without disenfranchising or excluding any particular group. We always think that when we include one group that we have to exclude another group, that it's a zero sum game, and it's not. And Brian talks about how everyone uh, is felt included in the company. The second thing he talks about is that managers need tools, need resources, need training in order to create inclusion and be inclusive leaders. It is not natural to all of us to uh, know how to model inclusive behavior, and we all need help. Some of the best men uh, that I work with will tell me, I want to help you, but I don't know how to. So can you help me? Can you give me tools to model inclusion? So I, I think Intel is a great model of a very systematic and broad-based inclusion program. There are a couple of other programs that I really like. Facebook has introduced a maternity paternity program that gives both parents a chance to bond with their children and establish their family successfully. I think it's so important for fathers and mothers to have that time together. It is, we are human, we will have families, we will have children, and we need to allow for that as businesses and not to uh, treat that as an extraordinary occurrence. The other program I like is something that PayPal is doing, and I think it's called Recharge, and it is helping mothers come back from maternity leave. And that's another area that most of us struggle with, where um, mothers who take time off to have babies realize that they fall behind, especially as engineers. You find that the world has moved you by. And you need to double up and learn that. And then you're also learning to cope with this new family, this baby, this timing, 
pick up at the daycare, and all of these struggles, which, which I did too. And so they're helping them ease their way back into the workplace. And I think the Recharge program is a fantastic example of you know, applying diversity and monies to the right initiative. But sadly, the numbers have not moved. A lot of great initiatives, but the numbers have not moved. Let's look at some numbers. When you look at O'Reilly's uh, software development salary survey, you find that women are still making 75%, 80% of what men are. And then you look at the number of women in software development, it's, it's really a very low number, 8%. Um, so I like two things. I, I always look at the silver lining in all of these things. I think it's wonderful that uh, California, the, the state of California has introduced equal pay law, and that's prompting a lot of companies to go back and systematically look at pay scales and to see if they are matching um, the pay scales across gender. Mark Benioff, I think famously, has also said that he's actually examining this. No one is saying that we need to pay uh, unequal jobs, but if two people are doing the same job, they ought to be paid the same. And that's only uh, very, from a technical perspective, from a data-driven perspective, it makes total sense to me. And we need to build that into our business models. When I look at the open source numbers, it's also pretty bad. Uh, Bitergia is a company that studies um, the community health. So they look at different aspects of different projects, open source projects, and their community health. So for this, we partnered with them uh, from the Linux Foundation, from the Apache Foundation, and from the OpenStack Foundation and said, can you tell us how many women are actually actively engaged in open source? And you find that the numbers are pretty dismal. You know, there are approximately 9 to 11% uh, in the population in open source, but only 7, 8% are actively contributing patches or doing Garrett reviews or in mailing lists. And I have a theory around this, which I will share with you later. So this is what prompted all of us from the Linux Foundation, from the OpenStack Foundation, to really uh, double up our efforts in terms of creating community and encouraging not just women, but uh, people who are underrepresented, people who are economically disadvantaged, and lots of other categories. I think when you invest in inclusion around gender, which is 50-50, then you really lift a lot of boats um, with that initiative as well. So just to summarize, when you have over 50% in the workforce, and you have only 30% in tech companies across different functions, and when you look at engineering, you have less than 18%, and you have less than 10% in open source, you've really got to ask the question, are we spending on the right things? And where do we need to make adjustments? Why have these numbers not moved? In the last three, four years, uh, with all the investment, our numbers have moved just a tad. So let me answer my theory on why there are so few women in open source. A couple of theories, one, a lot of women don't use their female name when they contribute. So that could cause uh, some numbers to go down. Second, we tend to measure uh, just the coding contributions, you know, the patch contributions, and we don't measure all of the other contributions women make in open source on the legal side, on the community side, and on documentation and other things. And so I think we should really calculate those into the numbers as well. But there are other factors such as, you know, many open source projects were born from a really wonderful technologist who had a problem that they were trying to solve. And these are great technologists, but they were never trained in how to build community or how to create an inclusive project, and they need the help to do that. So very often they're technologists, but they don't have uh, the skills to build community as well. The other thing that happens is reputation uh, gets around, you know, when there are some projects that don't do so well, then that whole uh, cloud of image of open source being a very difficult uh, area to work in uh, tends to cloud it. And there are a couple of other reasons, such as uh, every project is different and there are millions of projects. It's hard to navigate the world of open source. The good and the bad of the numbers, and this is meant to be the halo and the devil, right? So I think all the investment has been really, really good. A lot of awareness, a lot of dialogue, 
I love the fact that companies publish numbers. We are all numbers oriented. Numbers make us work harder to kind of improve those numbers. Um, the best thing I like is the fact that when I started my career in technology, we would talk about the woman needs to change. And I needed to fit into the work environment. I often wore, you know, Oxford shirts, little bow ties, dressed like the guys. And, and I, I really couldn't wear ethnic wear. I couldn't look feminine. And it, you know, I remember a boss saying, don't wear all those bangles to work. You know, they're, they're just distracting. And, and today, I think the dialogue has really shifted to environmental change, that the workplace needs to change to accommodate lots of different types of people coming in, that the workplace was optimized and built for men who, who really were the founders and, and kind of, you know, in the workplace for a very long time. So that needs to change if we have to have different kinds of people coming into the workplace. I love that change and that shift. The bad part is the numbers haven't changed, which we have talked about. The stories in the press lately have been pretty depressing, haven't they? And, and just not good. Um, and there is continued backlash and trolls. You know, when you talk, speak about uh, a topic, uh, I, I get a lot of backlash on, on Twitter, but I just block them and continue to move forward because this is a long game. I am not going to be deterred by a few trolls on the, on the internet. And, and less than 18% going into tech. I have two daughters, and, and both of them didn't get into tech. And I said, why? And they said, oh, I don't know. It just feels so lonely and, you know, sitting in the corner, coding away. And so I'll, I'll address that. Continue to have low numbers in leadership and a continued high attrition. By the way, we really need to pay attention to that leaky bucket. I think we're doing a good job recruiting, but we're losing women uh, along the way. Common excuses that I hear, which really bother me, um, women and tech. Women are not meant to go into tech. They're not good at tech. And I, I think we heard it recently. And, and frankly, when I look at hidden figures, I look at Anita Borg, I look at Ada Lovelace, I look at Grace Hopper, I say, I, I don't understand what you mean that women are not good at tech or don't go into tech. We've been doing tech you know, since Lord Byron's days, right? And then uh, the other uh, excuse I hear is, if you don't start early, you've got to get them into coding camps at six. If you don't, game over. You know, by the time they go to an AP class, it's game over. Not really. I started at 20. And, and there are many, many programs like um, you know, uh, college programs that are introducing women to technology later in life. Yes, there's bias in the system, but there are a lot of tools. There's lots of awareness and process around removal of bias. Yes, it's a hostile environment, but that's why I think there are lots of ways to correct for that hostility. And the, it starts with awareness, it starts with intent, and it starts with investment. These other ones I, I really get very, very uh, angry about or frustrated about, that you somehow have to lower the bar in order to bring diversity in that somehow uh, you've got to make concessions in quality in order to bring diverse candidates in. And you can have both. That's not at all the case. Uh, pipeline issue, yes, it is real, but it can be solved. If you can uh, go to the right places to recruit, if you build a proactive pipeline before you need to recruit for that job, if you uh, ask the women in your organization also to cast their net, you can bring in uh, candidates into the company. And Dirk uh, reached out to me when he was recruiting. And, and I think that's how you help each other. Too difficult to do. A lot of managers have said to me, ah, I've got a business to run. This is too much work and I don't want to do this. Or we are overcorrecting. You have to overcorrect people. If you are sitting at 18%, you've got to overcorrect. You've got to invest. You've got to make changes. And it's not changing. So you've got to invest uh, for the long run. So Dirk and I talked yesterday about the fact that not every role in tech is sitting and coding in solitary splendor. Uh, yes, you need to do that too. There are those roles 
But there are also roles uh, such as product manager, such as test engineer, such as program manager, with different levels of communication, collaboration, teamwork, uh, skills. And so women can really fit into a lot of these. I think we've got to dispel that narrow image that tech is just coding, wearing a hoodie and sitting in a corner and, and coding, because that's what puts off a lot of women too. And, and it can be lots of different roles in tech. It does not have to be just a developer. Uh, I love this picture, again, because it talks about the fact that the world needs to be working with women and not that women need to change to work with men. I mean, for God's sake, that's what we enjoy about diversity, right? That we celebrate differences, that the differences is what makes innovation interesting, that everyone brings a different perspective to the table. The introverts, the extroverts, uh, you know, the global diversity, the diversity in gender, the, everything shapes the way you innovate. And from an open source perspective, there are a number of things we can do. I think it starts with leadership. Uh, it starts with tools and support for maintainers, because maintainers often are technical people. They need help in shaping diverse, diverse communities. And people like GitHub are doing a good job of teaching uh, communities how to build better communities, for example, through code of conduct, through having a license document, through having a README, getting involved guide, so that it becomes a more friendly and inclusive community. Um, the, at the end of the day, there are two things I want to also take away from this slide. One, it's okay to have a code of conduct in place, but the action of the code of conduct is what's more important. So if there is a violation, if you don't pay attention to it, if you don't act on it correctly, that sends the wrong message. So just because you have a code of conduct doesn't mean that it's, it's done, that it's a tick mark. At the end of the day, men and women want to work in communities that ensure them that there is trust among the participants and that there's safety, that they can be themselves, that they can contribute. So if you want to contribute to open source, my advice to you is observe the community, lurk in the mailing lists, observe and see what kind of culture they have. How do they respond to patch requests? Don't get involved in a community if it's toxic, if, if people don't respect each other, if they don't treat each other right. It's your choice whether you want to use your name or not use your name. Build support systems, do not go into it alone. And that's why we've created things like Women of Open Source under the Linux Foundation umbrella or Women of OpenStack, because you may often find yourself to be the only woman in a project. And so it's nice to have support from other women across other communities to be able to have a trusted conversation. Look for mentors and role models. I was very lucky to have mentors and others who led me through this. When I first started working in open source, if I didn't have someone like Jeremy Allison explaining to me how open source worked, how communities worked, how I should get involved, what I can say, cannot say, how to submit my first patch, et cetera, I, I would not be successful. And I'm very grateful for all those folks. Um, Network and be visible. It's so easy to kind of, especially when you're an, uh, an online contributor, to be alone and to not kind of make friends or create uh, other uh, per people that can support you. And, and it's important to be visible. It's important to blog. It's important to talk. I talk about the fact that we need to have different voices in the community because each voice strengthens the others. When I see images like VMware has everywhere, it says to me, I belong here. I'm okay. The way I look is okay. And, and that people like me are contributing, are part of this technology community. And so it's important to share your voice, share your experience so others can benefit from it. And last but not the least, uh, don't burn out. Take care of yourself. Uh, many of my open source buddies say that if they do come into situations that are frustrating, they step away, they have other interests, gardening or travel or whatever, and then they come back renewed back into um, the uh, community. Takeaways for companies and foundations. I particularly included foundations here because Dirk and I are lucky enough to um, be part of the 
board which is shaping uh, the Linux Foundation. And the Linux Foundation has become such a big, big presence in the open source community with some very key influential projects, whether it's the Hyperledger project or the ONAP project, the Cloud Foundry or uh, CNCF. And um, we have a platform, we have an opportunity to shape the culture of open source communities. We have an opportunity to contribute to making it a more level playing field for the community by, by really modeling it in the projects under the Linux Foundation. So we have an opportunity to do that. And companies have an opportunity not just to shape what happens inside their companies, but also to shape uh, open source communities, frankly, because all of us participate in different communities and we can influence the culture of those communities as well. And for companies, it's, it's exactly what Betsy said. It starts at the top. It starts with Pat and Betsy and the leadership team saying that this is part of our business imperative. This is important to the company and its strategy. And it starts with them enabling every single manager in the company, every single leader, to be able to practically implement inclusive leadership every single day. Because in a meeting, in a promotional discussion, in uh, a, a project discussion, if you cannot model inclusion, then the words are just words and it needs to be in action. Um, I think companies like VMware and Comcast are examining all of their policies and processes from hiring all the way to retention to development of uh, women. And those policies need to be examined for bias because we are human and we build bias into the processes we create, into the algorithms we create, into the, into the systems we create. And we need to examine them for bias and correct for bias. And we need to take all escalations about bias and harassment very, very seriously, as we saw from some of the stories that we saw recently in the press. And frankly, it is, it is very natural for a company to protect its interests, but um, it also needs to protect the human beings that work in the company, and, and Betsy is very well aware of that. And, and, and it's so important to make sure that there's a, a sense of trust, a sense of, uh, um, I guess, uh, you know, honor in, in an organization, because all of us come to work to uh, be respected, to be cared for, and, and, and to really make an impact and to be fully engaged. Um, and in the last one, I'll, I'll talk more about as well. And isolation is a, is a really big problem, which is what's causing uh, a lot of people to drop out of uh, companies, uh, women in tech in particular, because most women are the only women in their teams. And uh, very often, every single day, it feels like a lot of micro um, inequities happening, whether it is in how uh, the conversation at the uh, conference table or uh, the activities for, you know, offsites or social um, or the way, uh, you know, they're addressed or they're included in activities throughout the day. Um, there's a tendency to feel increasingly isolated. And most boards, uh, at the board level, most uh, companies and theories and uh, studies talk about the fact that you need to have at least three people in a team in order to create um, and, and unleash, if you will, the diversity of that group. Because if you're just one person, you tend not to speak up. If you're two people, you cancel each other out. If you're three people, you finally feel the courage to really bring what, who you are as a diverse candidate to the table. And so we need to address isolation through employee resource groups, through lean-in circles, through uh, having you know, enough of a critical mass in teams in order to uh, create um, success. And, and, and there's a very interesting saying which says that you know, diversity is like including inviting someone to a dance and, and inclusion really is allowing them to dance and actually allowing them to come out and, and, and add to the discussion. So in terms of are we there yet? I don't think we are. I know we all recognize the fact that we need to be there because we have to recruit more people. Uh, we have a gap. And we know that inclusion is innovation. We know that inclusion requires intention. And we know that it's a long game and we need to persist. I keep reminding myself every day 
uh, it does not happen in a day. And, and workplaces have been built over many, many years. So we have got to persist. We've got to continue to uh, invest in it. So my call to action to all of you is become an ally, become an advocate, men and women, become an advocate and an ally for each other, know how to support each other every single day, um, in every meeting, in every event, and in every uh, conversation. Um, and I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you today. And I hope um, I've answered some of your questions about why this is important. Absolutely terrific. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you Thank so you. much. Oh, my. You know, it's people who come and um, not only are doing the work, but tackling the challenges and talking about the work that are making a difference in this world. And so I think Comcast and the Linux board and all of us here today, we're very fortunate to be able to listen to you. So thank you so much for coming. Continue your journey. I love it. Yeah. All right, with that, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce our next speaker. She is a producer, a director, and an entrepreneur. She's actually a creator of some very powerful cause-based documentaries, the most recent being Code Debugging the Gender Gap. If you haven't taken a look at it, I highly recommend it. I've seen it four times. With that, Robin Hauser's enthusiasm and her devotion and her passion around women in tech and increasing diversity is inspiring. So please join me because it's my absolute pleasure to have her here today, Robin Hauser. Thank you. Thank you so much, Betsy. I want to give a shout out to the men in the room. <laughs> I always think that at a conference like this, when they're 85% men in the first place, I think we have all women pretty much, except for some men. So I just, I think that we should name sessions like this something like Beer and Tech or, <laughs> I don't know, the, the Secrets to Women in Tech or I don't know what, but we've got to name it something a little bit catchier to get men into the room because otherwise this is like an echo chamber, right? Um, but no, honestly, thank you to the, to the men that are here. I think this is all about male allies and how important it is for us to recruit you as, as allies. Um, let's see if we can get the first one up. So well, I had a daughter who was in college several years um, ago, and she has always been fairly academically competent. She calls home one day and she says, Mom, I'm switching my major from computer science to art history. And I said, OK. Um, she said, Mom, I don't belong. There's only one other woman in my computer science class. Clearly, I don't know half as much as the, the people in the class do. Uh, I just, I, I'm not meant to be here. And I said, go talk to your teacher. She said, Mom, this is college. Nobody talks to their teachers. <laughs> so finally, she does go in and talks to her professor. And he says to her, you know, you're doing fine. Take the next class. And she gets into the next class. She calls home then. A couple months later, she says, I'm failing. I said, you are not failing. This is ridiculous. She drops the class, becomes an art history major. She had a high B average. To her, she was feeling like she wasn't doing well. And at the same time that all of this was going down, newspapers were coming across our doorstep saying, hey, you want to get a job out of college? You better know something about computer science. And then the White House issued a report that said by the year 2020, there would be over 1 million computer science-related jobs that are unfilled in the US. I thought, this is crazy. What's going on here? Why aren't we encouraging more people? Who are we missing? We're missing women and people of color. And why aren't we doing more in our schools to help get more women and people of color? So naturally, I decided to make a documentary about this. Um, it was just a project that I thought would be interesting maybe to people in, in Silicon Valley, maybe Silicon Alley, Silicon Swamp. Um, it <laughs> turned out that uh, we had sort of crazy success. This is the trailer for the film.
There will be 1.4 million jobs by 2020 in the computing-related fields. Less than 29% of them are going to be filled by Americans, and less than 3% of that 29% are going to be women. I don't think software engineering is a meritocracy. Being excellent or being good at your job isn't enough if you're a woman in tech. The sort of phenomenon of the programmer has really interested me. Programmer. 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 It's hard to encourage more women to come into an environment that will sexually harass them and not fund them. As soon as a woman gets introduced, it's like blood in the water. When companies started putting these full diversity disclosure reports out there, it became very obvious, wow, there really is a problem. This is something that we need to be trying to address. Women were the pioneer programmers. They've been written out of history, unfortunately. Grace Hopper came up with the concept of real programming languages. Ha, coding's magic. I like coding because instead of us being consumers, we could be like a producer. In the same way that everyone should know a little bit about law and everyone should know a little bit about economics, you probably should know a little bit about computer science. Growing up, I was actually a, a system kid. I didn't know that I could learn how to code like so quickly. The reason that there's a gap is actually related to some really real structural factors. Girls aren't encouraged to pursue computer science. They're overlooked because, you know, it's the boys that are good at science and it's the boys that are taking apart computers at age nine. Most students have no exposure to programming. Computer science should be a requirement in all public schools. This is a Rosie the Riveter moment because the jobs are here and we don't have the workers to fill them. For the digital revolution to truly be great, it can't just be for a certain set of people. I'm hopeful because I think that the tech industry could move the fastest. If we see the problem, we can debug it. This is our country, our cities, our communities, our children, our code. Code. Debugging the gender gap. Thank you. So we ended up premiering um, at Tribeca Film Festival in New York City in April of 2015. Um, I was really optimistic when I went back. I went back by myself, and I bought tickets to all these other film films that I wanted to see at the festival. Um, I got to meet Robert De Niro. That was really cool, really fun. And I thought I'd have all this free time, but the minute that this film uh, screened during one of the press screenings, I got bombarded, like completely, totally bombarded with press um, inquiries. And I mean, I don't have a PR agent. I didn't have anything. I was completely ill-prepared. Um, and it was really exciting for me, a little bit overwhelming. But I ended up, you know, in a taxi talking to Vogue as I was driving to CNN Times Square to do an interview with CNN Money. And we ended up in USA Today, Fortune, Forbes, uh, The New Yorker. I mean, it was crazy. It was absolutely um, fa fabulous, really. But I thought, I'm really... I guess it was just sort of overwhelming for me to realize that this was such a big issue. And what we did realize eventually was that we weren't just making a film about the lack of women in tech, but that we hit upon issues that women and people of color face across industries. So two and a half years later, the film's been to the White House. We screened it on Capitol Hill. It went to Congress, went to NASA. It's been to 64 countries. I think I've been to maybe seven countries um, with it. I went to Cambodia with the State Department this summer, and I screened it in a fishing village, and like 50 people showed up to see it. And half of them probably didn't really even know what coding was, but they were fascinated by it because they could relate to it just by being a woman. I mean, that, that's, that's incredible. That was payback for me, uh, you know, 100 times over. You can find it on, um, on Netflix. It's been broadcast at uh, BBC Persia, CNN Canada, Al Hura Middle East. Uh, it's also been to France and Brazil and all over Latin America, uh, Russia, um, Nigeria. So it's been, it's been a fabulous project. And as I was talking about this film, screening it at companies um, really all over the, the world, one term kept coming up, especially in the United States, and that term was unconscious bias. And I thought, unconscious bias? I remember scribbling it down on a piece of paper. I was sitting on a panel at the time thinking, what does that mean? What is that? Implicit bias, you hear people talk about as well. And so I began to look into what was unconscious bias, and I really was fascinated by the fact that if you have a brain, you have bias. Every one of us is biased in some ways. And that there are reasons for that. 
right? Back in caveman days, it was how we were protected. We protected ourselves through these biases. And now that we have technology at our fingertips, in our purses, in our cars, in our hospitals, everywhere, we take more shortcuts. And when we're taking more shortcuts, because we're getting done so much more in three hours in any one day than we would have gotten done in two weeks, right? 25, 30 years ago. So what is this doing? It's leading us to take shortcuts. And as we take shortcuts, we rely more on our biases. Well, we don't think we're doing it because none of us realize exactly how much or how, what our biases are. We actually have a physiological inability to recognize our own biases, our unconscious biases, right? But we can see it in other people. Fascinating. It's like you can't do two math problems in your head at once. So we, can't, we, we, we are not able to understand all of our own biases. So I decided I was going to make a film on unconscious bias, and I named it Bias, because it's better to start a film with a B than it is with a U, especially if you're searching on Netflix or something. <laughs> and I was a little worried that this title would maybe turn people off, that they'd think once again, you know. But I decided, though, how am I going to do this then? Okay, first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to put myself in as a subject. I'm going to completely avail myself to the fact that I'm a privileged white woman, and I have tons of biases, and let's see what they are. It's like a self-discovery project. So here, it, it's been a really interesting discovery for me. Here's the uh, sizzle reel that we put together early on. This does not incorporate all that's in the film clearly, but this is what we put together early called a sizzle reel um, to look for funding. If you're human, you have bias. Just like we breathe, we have bias. It's part of who we are. When it becomes completely unconscious, we have no idea how it's affecting our behavior. I see you, I make a quick judgment about you as a person. Depending on my stereotypes about what somebody like you in your role should look like or could look like. No one really feels like they're biased. And it's not that they're self-aggrandizing at all. It's no different to not having the machinery to do you know, two math tasks at once. We don't feel biased because we actually can't process if we're being biased or not in real time. We want to create a playing field that is level for everyone. The challenge is we tend to think about our own behavior as somehow more fair and free of bias than it is. Good morning. Well, a new study shows people don't take hurricanes as seriously if they have a female name. And the consequences of underestimating them can be deadly. I talked to a lot of voters who said, yes, I feel comfortable voting for a woman, but just not Hillary Clinton. She's too shrill, she's too loud. All of the signifiers are connected to the way that researchers look at gender bias and discrimination. Almost every woman that becomes a firefighter knows that we are held to a different standard, a higher standard, if you will. You really have to work just as hard, if not harder, than the guys to perform. You don't want to mess up ever, or make a mistake, because you're kind of carrying it for the rest of the women. Some people don't even know what the term is. They say, fire, what are we supposed to call you? You know, firefighter is the term for a man or a woman. My experience may be similar to a lot of women in technologies and maybe in the workplace in general, which is like, I feel like I was pretty clueless about a lot of the gender issues in my 20s. And it wasn't until my 30s that I think I started to realize like, wow, there is actually a lot more bias than I thought. It's not an even playing field. I, I would like to know why the last associate producer before me made $50 a week more than I do. Oh, because he was a man. <laughs> Without stereotyping what men and women think, oftentimes men will make a decision for a woman without even asking the woman. <laughs> 
For instance, if there's a new opportunity for a promotion, it might require longer hours or travel, and they just assume, well, she wouldn't want that position because she just had a baby, or she's got two young kids, or her husband has a big job and travels. People think they're doing the right thing, but it actually is working against you know, your career opportunities. We have news tonight about women in the workplace. The hard fact is that women run only 4% of companies in the Fortune 500, and a new study shows almost twice as many women as men say they've been turned down for a job because of their sex. It is hard to break out as a woman. It is very hard. But there's so much about bias that's self-perpetuating. And we do it to ourselves, people do it to us, and we take false signals of I'm not good enough or whatever, and then bias becomes a label. And that's, that, doesn't, that doesn't give us a solution. There are, are two good reasons for anyone to try to figure out how to make more women or racial minorities or other groups that traditionally have had less success uh, more successful. And that's one is it's just the right thing to do, and two is you can make more money. I think those are both valid. We have study after study after study documenting that diverse teams are more productive, are more creative, that companies that have higher rates of gender diversity, 15% financially outperform others, but that more than doubles to 35% financial outperformance when you add racial and ethnic diversity. Whether it's an investment decision or a business decision you're making within your corporation, you have to believe that a diverse set of opinions or knowledge base around the world gives you a better world perspective, gives you access even to a bigger audience. When you have a room full of only men who generally have the same experience trying to solve a problem, you will not get an answer that is nearly as robust as when you have a room with a super diverse group of people who are all passionate about solving that same problem. You just won't. To get there, we need to take a deeper look at organizational climate and culture. The problem with them is that we made them. And in making them, we can pattern our own biases right into them, and suddenly they take on a life of their own. I don't think we can ever fix bias in perception, right? I think asking somebody how to be mindful of changing their perception, and even with good intentions, that's very difficult. I do think we can introduce software and maybe other interventions that help make sure that the content that's put out in the world in the first place really minimizes the chances of bias. It's very tempting for all of us to want to work with people who are just like us and who we'd be comfortable hanging out with and want to have a beer with. But what that means is I'm creating a cocoon of yes around me. But if I can think a little bit further and say, instead of hiring someone for a culture fit, I want to hire them for a culture contribution. And that culture contribution might be greatest if they are different from me. There's a world of difference between your intentions and your impact. I'm not questioning whether somebody has good intentions. I'm helping them understand the impact of their behavior. Thank you. With, we are um, finishing up that film now, and um, we hope to premiere it, well, let's just say early 2018. We'll see which film festival we're accepted to, but hopefully at least by, by the end of um, the second quarter of 2018. So I'm excited about that project, and we can dive a little bit deeper into it. First, I'm curious, how many people were caught in that riddle? The first time, I mean, I definitely was. Do you know that equal numbers of women and men think that they, they're thinking, well, wait, okay, maybe he's married, maybe he's homosexual, and therefore it's the father. I mean, they're looking for every other way but to think that the, that, the, that the surgeon could be the boy's mother. It's interesting. And I think that's a really good example of how it's not that we actually believe that women can't be surgeons. It's just societal messaging. 
normally the surgeon is a man. And that brings up something that's pretty interesting. We were talking a little bit about, about bias and how bias works its way into open source, how bias works its way into artificial intelligence. Word embedding, a lot of that's happening. For instance, if you wrote the, in Turkish, which is, has gender, gender neutral, doesn't have gender pronouns, if you wrote in Turkish to translate into English, the doctor cared for, his, for its patient, it would automatically go to the doctor cared for his patient. And if you said the nurse attended to its patient, it would come out saying her patient. So it's kind of scary to think that artificial intelligence is just picking up through word embedding on societal norms and perpetuating those stereotypes. So if we dive a little bit deeper into some of the issues that we're covering, aside from bias and AI, which we're, we're covering as well in the film, um, Frida Kapor Klein brings up, I think, something that's pretty interesting. This is what she has to say. Every year, somebody puts out a report and says, gee, we didn't really move the needle. Gee, we ought to be doing a better job. Gee, it's somebody else's fault. Nobody's head rolls. I don't know of any other issue in corporate America where you set a goal, you spend billions of dollars, you fail, and everybody says, oh, well, let's keep at it. The fact that we have not seen senior executives removed because they missed their diversity numbers. They get removed all the time for missing their sales numbers. So I'm waiting. Interesting, right? The trend that I've noticed is in the last, let's just call it five years, and that's being generous, is we need to get a diversity inclusion head, right? We need somebody to run diversity inclusion. Look at then how quickly or how, let's just say, how long does that person actually stick at the company? I can tell you that I know somebody who was the head of diversity and inclusion at Google and then at Twitter and then at Dropbox and now working on her own. I know someone that was Expedia and is now at Pixar. I know somebody that was at Apple, I believe, and then Twitter and now probably can't announce where that person's going. But it's crazy. And why is that? I think it's because a lot of companies are saying, let's get ahead of DNI. This will show that we care about the issue. Let's do it because we need to do this. But when that person comes in and says, these are the structural changes, these are the procedural changes you need to do in HR, that you need to do in your workforce in order to really get an inclusive and diverse society, team, community, they're not willing to do it. It takes a lot. It takes a huge effort and it's something you have to keep your eye on and continue with. Mazran, has anybody ever taken the IAT, the Implicit Association Test? All right, this is fast. Yeah, a few people here. Mazran Banaji and Tony Greenwald co-authored this several years, many years ago now, over, over 10 years ago. Um, Mazran's at, at Harvard now, and Tony Greenwald is at the University of Washington. And it's the IAT, or the Implicit Association Test. You can take it online. It tests your biases, your unconscious biases. I sat down with Tony one day, and I said, okay, let me take the one on race. And he said, no, 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 let you take the one on associations of women at home versus men in the workforce. I said, Tony, come on, I'm the biggest womanist around. Forget about it. He goes, yeah, exactly. I want you to take this test. So I sat down to take this test in front of him. And the results were, and the funny thing is, at the very beginning, there's a warning, and it says, you might not be happy with, you know, disclaimer. <laughs> you might not be happy with the results we're about to tell you. And I said to Tony, was this in an effort to be funny? He said, no, no, we got, we've gotten hate mail from people when they get the results of these tests. I sat down and they give you the words that they're not tricking you. They give you the words. These are the words, these are the five words we associate with home. Family, nursery, kitchen, a couple words like that. These are the words we associate with work. Job, boss, contract. I said, okay, this is gonna be easy. So I take the test. 
And you're just literally pressing one key on the right, one key on the left. Here are men's names, here are women's names. Easy. Great, now we're going to put the women's names on one side, the men's names on one side. Easy. All right, now we're going to put words we associate with home on one, one hand and words they associate with work on the other hand. Now we're going to switch it. Okay. Now we're going to put men in workplace on one side and women in home on the other side. No problem. Okay, great. Robin, you're doing great. Now we're going to put women in work and men in home. I couldn't do it. Completely befuddled. I got this big red X kept appearing on the screen. <laughs> Seriously. At the end, it said, you have a strong association with women at home and men in the workplace. <laughs> now I understand why you put the warning up. I turned to Tony, I'm like, what? Yeah, now there's been some criticism to the IAT. There are people say that if you practice a lot, you can get it better. I've been practicing a lot. I think I've gone from severe association to moderate association. <laughs> But I'm telling you that it's, it's real and it's scary. I took one, um, I took the IAT for uh, black Americans and harmful objects and white Americans and unharmful objects. I have a moderate association with black Americans and harmful objects. Guess what? 75% of the population, including African Americans, have that same association. Was I chagrined, embarrassed? Did I feel shame? Absolutely. And this is part of what I'm trying to figure out. Where does this come from? So Mazran says some really interesting things. And here's something that's not quite on that subject, but is equally interesting, something I think we can all relate to. is a very important part of all this. I don't believe that people in the modern world, like ourselves, discriminate by harming members of other groups. That's gone from our history. I'll never get on a horse and ride into a village and rob their gold and take their women and bring them to our village. That's not what I'll ever do. The way I will discriminate, though, is by who I help. And it's by giving a leg up to the ones who come from my university or my neighborhood or my kind of people in some way. That's the way in which I continually keep the playing field uneven. And I can feel good about it at the end of the day. I helped somebody. I'm just gonna let you digest that for a minute. Pretty intense, right? Think about how often we do that. Oh, I went to UC Berkeley. Yeah, I'll hire a girl from Cal, absolutely. Why wouldn't I? Why do I give her the benefit? Why do I suddenly kind of like that candidate better? It's not just because of like me bias, which is a real thing, but I feel good about it. I'm giving back to my university. And what does that say? How are we then limiting our ability to have a diverse team by doing that? I think this is a lot why Silicon Valley looks the way it does, why venture capital looks the way it does. Okay, I have to end with Mary Tyler Moore because you saw a little clip there, but I think this is actually brilliant. And she's my hero. Because when you think about the fact that this came up in the 1970s, she brought up subjects and things that were completely taboo to even talk about. So watch this carefully. Hey, uh, Murray, Gordy, yeah. would you say that I'm doing, a, you know, as... as Good a job as the guy who was the associate producer before me. Better. Oh, much better. Yeah, he was terrible. Yeah. Well, then, uh, how come he was making $50 a week more than I do? Well, how do you know he was? Well, because I was just going over the old budget for, for the meeting, and, and here it is. He made $50 a week more. $50. So... Yeah. Find anything interesting? Uh, yes, yes. M Mr. Grant, I, uh... Look, I I'm, I'm gonna try not to, uh... I was, I was just sitting at my desk, and, uh... I don't know how I, I, I could work here if we're...
You know, I really feel confident about that meeting with Stoneham today. We had a pretty good year. Got a list of awards here that we won. Okay, the Mickey Mouse Awards, but he doesn't know that. All right, the ratings haven't I been so... I don't believe this. What? I, I'm upset, and, and you're, you're just ignoring it. Well, I figured it was just one of those woman things. <laughs> no, Mr. Grant, it's not one of those woman things. I, I would like to know why the last associate producer before me made 50 dollars a week more than I do. Oh, because he was a man. <laughs> Let me get this straight. Uh, mm -hmm. The only reason he was paid more than I am is because he was a man? Oh, sure. It has nothing to do with your work. <laughs> wait, no, no, no. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You know, because I, cause I really, I, I want to understand this. Uh, I'm doing as good a job as he did. Better. Better. <laughs> and I'm being paid less than he was because... You're a woman. Well, Mr. Grant, there is no good reason why two people doing the same job at the same place shouldn't be making he the same... He had a family to support. You don't. Now, why don't you come back when you have an answer to that? <laughs> Financial need has nothing to do with it. Because in order to be consistent with what you're saying, you would have to pay the man with three children more than the man with two children. And the married man more than the bachelor. And Mr. Grant, huh, you don't do that. So what possible reason can you give me for not paying me at least as much as the man who had this job before me? Say, Lou. Yes, Ted. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know you were busy. Oh, we're not. We're not. Come on in, Ted. <laughs> So, I mean, there's so many parts of that that, I mean, it, yeah, it's funny, but it's also a little scary to see that that was the 70s and where we are now and, and that so much of it hasn't changed from, um, you know, the assumptions about why a woman might be emotional to um, the man erupting that goes on at the end uh, to changing the subject about something that she wants to talk about. Um, the gender uh, pay gap in the United States is, is still 20 percent. Um, so it's, it's a big problem. And, um, and there are a lot of companies that we look at in the film. In particular, we actually look at GoDaddy. Uh, we do a study on GoDaddy in Bias Film because we think it's really interesting to see not only how Blake Irving changed the culture of his company um, from some of the crazy, sexy ads that were happening early on with Bob Parsons, um, and then what they did to rectify the gender gap and to look at um, promotion trajectory within the company to make sure that women were getting the same opportunities for promotion. So that's an interesting study that you will also see in Bias Film when it's ready. And with that, I would love to bring up the panel. So. So you have the titles and everything. We have Kathy and Dirk and Julie. Hi. Hi. Thank you so much. These chairs were made I, for men. That's yeah. why you gotta wear the long skirt. I, I that's actually what, that's why I did it. <laughs> it was it was Thank funny you. before before we started, I came in here and I was asked, because I was the first of the speakers to come, I was asked, I'm like, I'm comfortable with this. Why don't you ask the women how they wanna sit? Yeah. Because this is easy. I was told by our media guy to check out the chairs before I did both of the panels today. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, no, that, that happens quite often. My, one of my favorite examples of that is the Apple Store in New York City. It was designed by a male architect and absolutely gorgeous, right? I'm sure a lot of us have been there. But at first, they couldn't figure out whether there was you know, a lot of women by the elevator and not going up the staircase. Well, the glass staircase <laughs> went up and around. <laughs> And it took them a little while before they realized they had to actually make all the stairs opaque because women, obviously wearing dresses and skirts, didn't want to walk up the glass staircase. I, I, I would like to believe that had there been one woman 
on that team of architects, they, she would have probably pointed out that maybe the glass stairs wasn't the best idea, design-wise. That's funny. Yeah, interesting. Um, Kathy, you have been uh, a woman in tech in a lot, for a long time. I'm curious what unco- the term unconscious bias means to you. Yeah. Um, by the way, that's a term uh, that resonates with me because... For me, you know, I think about, was there any event? You know, was, there, was the bias so obvious? And the answer is no. There was a lot of very subtle things that happened in my career, starting, you know, from the beginning to the end. And I'll give you some examples. Things like holding meetings at 5 o'clock or, hey, let's go out after work. But by the way, I'm not going to invite you because the guys are going to go out and do this. And I was the only woman in... Uh, at, at the time, I was at HP. I was in procurement, and even where we sat, so I was actually the leader, and we were sitting with some Japanese suppliers, and they put me at the very end. And you know, if you know Japanese culture, you, the, the leaders are supposed to be in the center, so they sat me at the end. Um, you, things like that have happened, and you know, I think that we have to do more. Uh, to be very aware of these things, right? We're doing these things, we're not even aware of it. And so just pointing it out and being more uh, just aware of these things will go a long way. So Julie, awareness is is one thing. Is it enough? Um, No, I don't think it is. I think it's the starting point. So awareness has to be there. Um, I think companies are are becoming more aware just because of... um, what you see in the media and everything. But I think we have to um, take a more active stance, if you will. And some of the things that we're doing is, um, we called it like, let's get serious about this. And um, we, bring, we bring visibility to women and minorities and just people in general. It doesn't have to be women or minorities. But at my boss's, um, staff meeting every week, we make sure that we give the opportunity for one one of us to bring an individual that we want to showcase. And we just let the person present. We let them talk about their project and uh, what they're working on. Because I think visibility is an important element of, uh, of getting a diverse workforce. You've got to give people the opportunity to be seen and be known and, uh, and, and get that across as well. Dirk, you said that you have 50% women I do. now, which I think is, is fabulous. I've heard so many people say, I can't find them. I can't find the women. I don't want to lower our standards, which particularly irritates me when I hear that. That assumption that you even have to say that we're going to hire for diversity <clears throat> and that means that you're going to have to lower standards. <laughs> How did you create this team? What, what, what measures did you take to get 50% women? Well, let's talk about lowering the standards. I have two... Uh, people working for me who have a PhD in hard sciences. They're both, of course, women. And in, in the workforce, who you get to hire depends on who you talk to. So you start working with recruiting and you say, if you, all you bring to me are white guys, then how am I going to, to hire a diverse workforce? So you bring in women that you know, you work on your network. I mean, as Nithya mentioned, I, I reached out to people that I knew. But then once you have the the first few, use them to help you find more. Because obviously there is a network around this. And use this network effect. Get the people you know who have a diverse workforce and engage with them. I have one of my African-American employees. I say, hey, can you help me find others, find candidates? When we talk to university recruiting, let's not just talk to Stanford. Let's talk to actually traditionally African-American universities. Let's talk to Scripps. Let's talk to women-focused universities. And that's how you actually create a candidate pool from which you can then pick the best. And I bet you the best will be 50% women. So hiring 50% women or even any percentage of women is, and people of color is one thing. Retention is another. Mm-hmm. Kathy, what do you think about, what are, what are some of the keys to actually retaining women and people of color? I think for me, and by the way, Dirk, I, I think as we talked about, in fact, Nithya talked about it, it's one thing to attract women, mm-hmm. right? As you say, 
how do we develop them and how do we retain them? And I think for me, it's creating an environment that is safe. That's the words that we've used, where you can feel comfortable being yourself. And you know, there's examples. I we, they have all the time when you have teams and there's one woman, and that one woman is supposed to be this brilliant. Uh, person and he has to say the right thing, or there's a situation where the woman says something and then the man says the same exact thing, and they get the attention yes. and they say, "What a great idea, Dirk!" Thank you for pointing at me here. <laughs> <laughs> But it's it's creating that environment which is really important. So one of the things that I practice, I actually call it open enrollment, which means I want to hear from everybody. It's really being a good listener mm -hmm. and really understanding. One, one, understanding your talent, whoever you have, whether it be man, woman, underrepresented minority, whatever it is, but understanding each and every one's talents and really ensuring that everyone has an opportunity to make a statement, a claim, to promote them, right, as far as what they do, being visible, those sorts of things are very, very important. I do also think that people like to be with people like themselves, right? And so, like you say, how do we get over that hump? Yeah. How do we get more women involved? And so by promoting these women, making them visible, as you'd mentioned, Julia, I think is also incredibly important, but really it's the environment. And I think each and every one of us, by the way, you don't have to be a leader to create the environment. Each and every one of us, as a team member, as a part of an organization, has a role in making that environment safe. I think what you say is very important. And this is something where the men in the room, you need to be the allies of the women in the meeting or of the minorities in the meeting. I, I had a situation, this is a few months ago, we were a fairly mixed team and actually a woman was leading the team. And as she was giving the presentation, one of the men in the room constantly interrupted her. It's uncomfortable to challenge somebody. I said, you know, would you just let her finish? She was making a point. Don't interrupt her all the time. He got very defensive and very upset. But I'm sorry, you have to actually give everyone a, an opportunity to shine and to do their thing. It was her meeting. So that's, it's really a call to everyone to, to help create this environment where people feel comfortable. And even if it hadn't been you know, her meeting, she, she was at the meeting and probably has a, a, has a, a right to, to be speaking, right? Yes. So. Yeah, Julia, any, any ideas about how those situations can be handled that you've seen sort of effective? Yeah, absolutely. We do similar um, that Kathy called out, uh, inviting folks who aren't speaking up to speak, I think is number one. Um, you know, I learned the hard way to just tell people, let, please let me finish and keep on talking. Um, in fact, it's, it's interesting. Um, along the way, I think I've I've hit most of the hurdles and either crumbled and cried at home or um, learned to overcome them. But uh, I, I think another thing that we've done to make the environment a better place for women is um, to not run meetings between 3 and 6.30 mm -hmm. at night. Mm -hmm. um, and we actually stood up and stated that. I had a really talented woman that I inherited. Um, she'd been with the company 10 years, so she had a tremendous amount to contribute. Highly regarded, running one of the critical IT projects. And she came and wanted to quit. And I'm like, why are you quitting? And she said, you know, I have two kids at home. She said, I work 15 hours a day. I'm in here. I'm here late. I just, I can't do it anymore. And I marched into the um, head of our HR department and I said, you know, we need to help this person. We shouldn't lose the talent. Uh, it'll take us, you know, money and time to replace her and everything else. So we did a few things. One, we shored her up and helped her with some time management because it's always, you know, incumbent on yourself to say no in certain situations. Um, we also did the no 3 to 5.30 meetings, and we did it across an organization of 2,000-plus people yeah. um, to try to do that. And what I see now with the women is you'll see, and, and not just women, you'll see men as well because a lot of the dads, I live in D.C., And a lot of the dads do the uh, Mr. Mm -hmm. Mom thing as well. So you, um, well, that was bad right there, wasn't it, on a diversity <laughs> panel? Um, but you, uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, you, see, you see people, though, leave at 3, and then you'll see a very quiet period from like 3 to 8 o'clock at night when people are fixing dinner, bathing children, doing homework. And then at like 8, 
8.30, all of a sudden you see this big uptick back where people are, you know, answering their emails and catching up. So I think some of the environment is about setting time boundaries as well. Can I comment Please. on Julie's comment? Because you talk about retention. Um, you hear this term, right, work-life balance or work-life integration. It's actually critically important. It affects everybody. Yes, we all, yes, we're all families. It, exactly. Whether you have children, you don't have children, you may have aging parents, you may have something else, a hobby or something that you're involved with. We need to be able to integrate work and life. And, and that's critically important for retention um, if you think about that. And it's funny, I have a really quick little funny story to tell. Um, I was leading, this was while I was at HP, I was leading a v huge task force focused on our SMB strategy. So it involved 100 people, and I was having one of our steering committee meetings. And every Friday, I had to leave to go do yard duty. Um, I'll explain to you what that is just a little bit later. <laughs> so, you know, we would have the meeting, the, the steering committee would end, and I'd say, I have to leave at noon because I have to go do yard duty. I'll be back at 1. Mm -hmm. You will see me. We're going to do this. Okay. One of the people on the task force finally worked up the courage to say, wow, you go home and you garden <laughs> for one hour and then come back? And I said, oh, no, 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 that, I don't go and garden. I actually, yard duty was recess duty because you know, having children, yeah. it was mandatory volunteer hours, had to do it. But the fact that he thought that I could go home and garden, I was actually very proud of that fact <laughs> 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 to say that balance can be anything, right? And so... It's about results, yeah. right? It's not about the time in the office. It's not about the clock, ticking the, you know, checking and making sure that you're punching the clock. It's about getting results. And if you create Absolutely. an environment where people feel safe and that they can do what they need to do, they're going to pay you 10 times over. Absolutely. You get the loyalty. I, I completely agree with that. I have a, a, one real funny story to add, too. So I went to my boss and I was talking about kind of this issue of, of time and the, the fact that we were losing women in what I'll call kind of the mid-tier of life, right? You're, when you're in your 20s, you're unencumbered and you can work all day and party all night, right? And then you hit your 30s or thereabouts and you're having your family and now you've got this big job because you're in middle management of IT, which I call the death zone. If you, can, <laughs> if, if you can survive middle management in IT because you have people above you who want things and you're running the team below you and it, it really is a tough career place to be. And I said, we're losing talented women in this middle zone of their life because they have it coming at them from all sides. And, um, you know, therefore we need to adjust our times and we need to be more flexible and let people work from home, at, you know, a day a week or go to the dentist, whatever it might be. And, uh, and my boss said, well, gee, I, I heard from this consultant that you know, that was really only women who didn't get promoted. And if you promoted the women, that you would retain them, and that was it. It wasn't about the time. It wasn't about the too much work. It was about, like, grumpy women who didn't get promoted. And I said, I said, gee, I said, that sounds like a consultant who never worked in the middle management of IT. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, but we're trying to have some of the flexibility, I think, as you say. And, and I think Kathy's right with the loyalty. You get the loyalty ten times back. I think that was one of the things, one of the many things that astounded me about the uh, recent Google manifesto mm -hmm. that James Damore wrote was when he made the assumption that men don't care about a live-work um, balance, you know, <laughs> like that, that to me was, was crazy. And I, and I think that, yes, as Facebook is um, now that Mark has, has two girls, right, um, they're beginning to care about paternity leave as well. What's really interesting is the next step if you're really going to deal with the mommy penalty, is, um, is making men take paternity leave. Mm -hmm. Because as long as men don't take it and women do, then that penalty still weighs on women, and people aren't going to want to hire women as much as they hire men. And Europe is beginning to, Scandinavia is beginning to um, implement actual policy that men have to take paternity leave as well, which that's I think interesting. is interesting. Yeah, yeah. that's very interesting. Um, so along those lines, Dirk, do you have to have a daughter to care about these issues? <laughs> so I, I happen to have two. I have twin girls. Um, but I don't think so. I think you should be able, I hope, all the men in the, in the room, I hope, you're able to relate to women. You may have a mother or siblings or, you know, nephews, nieces, aunts, whatever. You, you should be able to relate to women without having to look at your own children. 
I will admit my children are non-white, so I have non-white girls in a world that is focused on white men. Um, it's eye-opening. I don't think it's the trigger that makes me aware or able to empathize or able to understand the challenging, but it is eye-opening as a dad when you engage and you see the, the way people respond to your children. It is fascinating. I have four sons. Okay, so, and, and by the way, I feel it's equally, if not even more important to tell them how important it is to be inclusive and to understand. And I think, I hope, I hope I'm a role model some days. I am not, um, but of a, you know, a strong working woman. And I said, hey, no matter what your partner is, you will support them no matter what, whatever that is. And I think it's important to raise young boys to understand inclusiveness and its importance. I, I absolutely agree with you. I think it's almost, you know, the mo one of the most important things we can do is to raise our daughters with confidence and, and raise our sons to be sensitive to these issues with, with women. And I think that's one of the things that's concerning me most about corporate culture and tech right now, is if these are products of baby boomers, how is it possible that sexism is still going on in the workplace or that is prevalent in venture capital, in tech, right now as we see it. Where is that coming from? Anybody, can anybody help me understand this? Well, I'll step out on that one. First of all, I think it's our culture. Um, so I'm, I'm friends with a number of women in Silicon Valley. I worked out in California for many years and, uh, and, and women in, in very, very big jobs. And uh, I, I think that our culture, we had, the reason I bring that up is we had talked about, gee, how do we combat this culture because you know, you watch TV, it's all about, you know, get a guy, like, to pay your way, right? You get all the housewives of whatever, right? And, uh, and forgive me if you like those shows. They're somewhat interesting. They're kind of fascinating, but they're, these are women who have their whole way paid for, and, um, and then they neglect their children, hang out in bars and wear mini skirts and things, and it's like, <laughs> gee, maybe it might be fun. So I think we have a culture, and, and, you know, no offense, I'll bring up the porn thing because I am a technologist, but, you know, you have porn at a level that we've never seen it, that, you know, uh, children are seeing and you know, eight and 10 years old, you've got, you know, these shows on TV. In some ways, it's almost like we're stepping back in time um, into this kind of odd anti-women culture. So I think that that plays in. Um, I think the tie to tech is also that uh, in some ways, um, you know, tech is, is considered a testosterone game and, you know, it's the survival of the fittest. And you, you know, I'm still dressing like a man. I came from the 80s. I'm wearing the, the men's vest and things. I can't get rid of it because it served me fairly well. Um, but, but I think it's the culture we're in and I think it's the times that we're in. And I think we're going to have to double down on the efforts to combat it. Um, the other thing that I have seen fall by the wayside because I am an old dog uh, is that we used to all, in the 80s, we all got carted off to diversity training. Every single one of us. We went to, you know, things where you jumped into your team's waiting arms off of bridges and things, and you name it, we did it. But, um, you know, in the last many years, I've seen far less of that. And I've seen, in, in, on the good side, I've seen some cultural influx into IT. And sometimes I think it's time to do that again. Um, in, in one company I worked for, we actually had to, you know, talk about, you know, that we don't scream at people in meetings and do some things like that. So I think it's time to do some of the diversity f training and things like that again. So I, I want to push back on this a little because you say it's this, the survival of the fittest, this meritocracy. Because if it was that, then the women would be on top. Because generally, <laughs> women have a lot more endurance, a lot more... They have a lot more willingness to double down. Because if you look at a woman who made it to a VP role, you know how hard they have worked. I got just promoted because I'm a white guy. And fundamentally, no, but... <laughs> no, a little more than that. But, but, but no, but, but if, you, if, you look at, if you look at the discrepancy in how much work it takes for underrepresented minority to actually make their way through, you know how much more they have done yes, to get there. Yeah. So no, it's not about a meritocracy. It's about this underlying bias of this 
like hires like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If, if you look for people who think like you, you'll find people who look like you. And, and that is to me the underlying problem. You need to start looking for people who disagree with me. And it's funny, the people who fight the most with me and my staff are of course my female employees. <laughs> and that's great because they challenge me to actually argue better and to make a stronger point or to give up and say, yeah, you're right. But fundamentally, that's what you need to look for and that's uncomfortable. I think it's, it's much easier to look for someone who agrees with you. It's, it's also, I'm going to disagree slightly just because for fun because you were calling out disagreement, but it, it is about the hiring, I agree. But it's also about the visibility, who are you giving assignments yeah. to. Um, you can hire like for like, um, but you have to also, you know, in order to get diversity in your workforce, you've got to give people the visibility. You've got to give them the key assignments. Mm -hmm. You've got to give people the things that allow one to get promoted and move up as well. You're not disagreeing with me at all. <laughs> I was teasing you. So you brought up uh, training, which I think is interesting. I know that uh, VMware is doing a lot of work with the Clayman Institute with um, Laurie McKenzie, who's done some amazing work in this. Does diversity training work? I don't think it works in and of itself, right? I mean, certainly there's facts, figures, information, perspectives, all of that is important. But you need to follow that up. I mean, I think, again, I say we as leaders, we as employees of a company, we have to be much more aware more self-conscious about these things. And, you know, you brought up these biases, you know, these biases that we have. Um, I think for me, I like to be very transparent. So I like it as well when people disagree with me. And I know there's some people on my team here, so, <laughs> okay, you know that. But, um, but I think that's really, really important. And it's important to understand where your, you know, where your blind sides are and, we as leaders just need to continue having the conversation, continue. It's not just having the conversation, it's the action, like you say, finding the right people, you know, promoting the right people and, and live by example. I think training gives you the, to, to your point, Kathy, training gets you awareness. Mm -hmm. That's what it gets you. And it gets you maybe the beginning of that conversation. Is it going to solve the the issue is no. It's right. got to be all the other. And I think it gives you the tools, right? I know especially the Clayman Institute does a lot of things about, about takeaways mm -hmm. and tools and what can you actually take back. But then it's a matter of keeping it fresh, right? But the thing that was in one of the video clips where, where she said, um, people don't get fired for not fulfilling these goals. And the challenge is, yes, the training gives you the awareness. And awareness is great. But taking awareness to action and being measured on that action and so every company, hopefully, by this point, has certain goals. And of course, they're confidential because you don't want them to get out. But these goals often are so insanely inambitious. And they're, they're so easy to fulfill because you want to look good next year. You want to have fulfilled your goal. Instead of putting up tough goals and saying, yes, this is going to be hard, but let's work on it. Let's create some action. And let's be okay with getting a B minus next year for having tried but not achieved it. Mm -hmm. But at least give yourself a goal that creates change. So are quotas the answer? No, quotas are not the answers because, because a quota ignores the individual. If, if I have two equally talented candidates, yes, I can certainly take the minority candidate to help reach my quota. But if I look for a position, if I look for a specialist in one area, and I have a, a white guy who's amazingly talented and, and two other candidates who really aren't, then if I hire one of the other candidates, I'm making a mistake. So no, a quota in itself is not the answer. Yeah, it's, it's creating this pipeline. Because so one of the things, okay, everyone wants to hire a female principal engineer. Fantastic. If you aren't willing to hire women out of college and give them the opportunity to get there, how are you going to hire the female leaders if you don't create that whole pipeline that gets them there? See, I was going to say that the quota is not the answer. I said opportunity is the yes. answer. And it's, again, our job, it, certainly as leaders now, mm -hmm. you know, we've risen to create opportunities, to devise new opportunities mm -hmm. that will allow females, underrepresented minorities, whatever you need to get that diversity in there. So 
it's not the same old, same old, right? And what can we do differently? How can we get out of the box so that we can create new opportunities that will allow for more inclusion? And, and I love the comment about it's not a zero-sum game. I can't recall one of, one of the ladies said that. I don't know if that was you or, or one of the earlier it was presenters. Yeah, that it's not a zero-sum game. You know, to me, the um, shortage of talent in tech is coming at all of us uh, at a high volume. If I have two qualified candidates and, uh, you know, I only have one slot, I'll go and request another slot. I'm yeah, going to double down. That's exactly if right. I got the white guy and the talented minority and, and they're both good people, I'm hiring them both. And I actually was faced with that recently where I someone found that came this to year. me and said, <laughs> you know, I got two good candidates. I'm like, hire them both. Yeah. Uh, because we are in a shortage, and, and we need to, you know, attack this on it's every level. It's true. And by the way, if you don't have the budget, you can find someone who has budget. Yeah, Get them in the company, right? It's important. It's going to cost you more later. Talk, yeah, talk, talk to Betsy. I know. It's very <laughs> simple. <laughs> Betsy is doing that. We are yeah. doing that. I have to say a shout-out to Betsy. I mean, at VMware, I know we're talking. Yay! Um, there are, there's a, I am, I'm involved. There is a female rock star that we're trying to get on to be a part of the VMware family. Is there an exact role for her? You know, was there a role already existing? No. We're going to create one. So myself and the CISO, we're working together to create a new role that will allow her to grow. And this is something I'm so excited yeah, about because exciting. she's going to be a beacon. You say, right? You see people up at that level. They attract others. And so this is something that we're doing at VMware as we speak. And, and they're role models then, right? And how important is it that we get more female role models? Um, I was speaking recently to somebody who was telling me that they were looking for a, uh, this was a VC and was looking for more women to bring on the board and how difficult it was um, to find women to bring onto boards. And I, I asked if this might have something to do with the fact that the qualifications were that you had to be the CEO of at least two or three companies. <laughs> Which is often the qualification that you have to have to be on that board. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, because there are so few women that have the, it, not that they have the ability, they have the um, opportunity, opportunity yeah. to rise to those levels, to rise to the top, of course the field of choices that they have are much lower. So think about the pipeline and how important it is to get women into upper management. Yes. And that will attract more women and then get more women into the boardroom. But I'd love to know your insight on that. But that works on every level. So one of the things you talked about earlier is how do you attract the diverse team? One of the funny things that's happening to me because I have a few women is that coworkers, female coworkers walk to my office and say, you got a minute, they close the door and says, oh, by the way, if you have another job opening, I would love to apply to your team. This has happened to me last month. Three different women walked up to me and say, once you have your next program manager role open, I'd love to apply to your group. Kudos we, to we, we, well, you this created is, the environment. But this is not about me. This is about the, the creating this environment, creating this opportunity, because that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah, absolutely. I just want to get a sense if there are any questions for the panel at all. Yeah, if there's a microphone right here, if you want to come up and... Hello. Hi. All right, first, Hi. I do want to apologize. I wasn't able to join until a little late. So if you've already covered this, I apologize. But a question for you about creating opportunities. How do you create an opportunity for women and minorities without it being unfair for like the talented white guys? So a, a fair question, right? I mean, I, I think this is one reason that we have the current administration that we have. It's because I think that that your average white guy began to feel somewhat disenfranchised and somewhat like they have their voice wasn't being heard for a while. I, I, I'll, I'll yeah. answer. So you're right. You can't, you know, obviously we can't create opportunities. That, by the way, the only people who can apply are women and underrepresented minorities. We can't do that. But what we can do, and this is where I say we're creating new opportunities, there's certain roles that, for instance, if we talked about people in middle management certain times in their lives where they need more flexibility, right? So there's roles that can be done more at home, right? Work from home. There are roles that can be done more flexibly where you don't have to meet as often. And so create opportunities that are more inclusive that allow these folks to, you know, succeed. I'll give you a very simple example. When I usually open uh, recs for tech roles, I always open two recs and they are slightly offset in grade. 
and I invite candidates for both RECs. And what happens is that you will get a much more diverse group if it's not just, oh, I need a super senior experienced person, but you offer a broader scale of opportunities. And then you see who applies and you may get lucky and you get a super senior minority candidate and you hire them, or you get people who aren't quite ready for that, but who would want to go there and you fill your second reg with them. As I said earlier, I've done this twice already this year, where I had the opportunity to bring highly talented people who maybe weren't quite there yet in their career development, but who will be in a couple of years. And, and to me, that is a wonderful way to not close the door to the top talent, but at the same time create opportunities for people who are on that path. Yeah, I don't think you can disenfranchise any one group. Yeah. I, I really don't like the idea of hiring someone um, just because of the color of their skin or the fact that they're a woman. In fact, I would hate to think that I got hired just because I was a woman. And I think most of the women yeah. I know would say the same. Um, so, so I do think, actually, um, Dirk brings up a great point about, you know, how do you post the jobs? How do you write job recs that attract mm -hmm. different types of people? There's actually studies done that say the verbiage in the job postings can be very off-putting. I to, had my wife to, proofread yeah, my job yeah. offers, yeah. Or have you heard uh, of Textio? Exactly. We're textio using Textio yeah. right now. So all of our um, job descriptions are being put into Textio. And boy, there's a lot of bias mm -hmm. yeah. written in, into the way we write job descriptions. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a great question. I, I don't think there's an easy answer. I think that you have to hire the best person for the job. Mm -hmm. But I think the, the key message that I'm really learning something up here today is about casting the wider net. And how do you do that? And how do you attract just a diverse set of people? Great. Thank you very much. We just have a few more minutes, but I, just, I also want to address the fact that um, I think there are a lot of incredibly well-intended well men who feel as though they they they're walking through a minefield. Um, they're, one of my, my daughter's uh, bosses said, I don't even want to compliment a woman and say that's a nice dress for fear of sexual harassment, mm -hmm. you know? And I hate to think that we're creating a, a corporate environment where human decency can't even be exchanged. I, so how do, we, how do we get there? How do we help people understand that it's about trust? I'll say something uncomfortable that may get me in trouble. One of, one of the things that I have noticed over the last couple of years is that in, in, the, in the aiming for perfection, um, we are alienating people who basically agree with us but don't live up to our expectations. And, and so you see all these guides, how to be the correct ally, what not to offer for help. And I always think if you were trying to get rid of allies, writing a manifesto like this is a great way to do it. I'm, I'm reasonably outspoken as, as someone who, who promotes women in the workplace, yet I get absolutely killed on Twitter by, by uh, what I then tag as social justice warriors, by people who say, oh, I'm not perfect enough. Oh, I said this thing over there that could be interpreted as something bad. So I think the, the risk of the pendulum swinging so far that we then get the government that we have right now it's real, and we need to be aware of finding a balance that is comfortable for everyone here on the panel. The three of you need to be comfortable, but at some level, the white guy might want to be comfortable as well. No, everybody I, I, should I, be. I agree as well, and I think as, um, as a woman or a minority, you also have to make others comfortable and let people know that you are part of the team. Um, I. I in every job I've taken, when I get into the room where I'm the only woman at the table or there's one or two of us there, uh, and the first time the guy says a swear word uh, or the F word even, they, they like all of a sudden they like, oh my God, there's a woman in the room and then they look at you like they're waiting for you to like leap up and run and get HR. Um, <laughs> It, you know, it, and it, I, you know, kind of make a point of unless it was, if it was really inappropriate, I would say something and I would get up and go get HR. But you know, in general, you do want to make people feel comfortable. And and you know, men do swear and, and women swear too. Quite frankly, I do as well. But you know, it, there's things, moments like that where 
you will be tested as the minority in the room and, and there are the small things you need to let slide. I do think it's gone too far in some regards. Most of the really senior men that run companies that I know, if you are a woman and you go in their office, they will not close the door. Because yes, they, I have a glass wall. Or they have a glass wall. Yeah. And so that um, starts to point at some things that maybe we are swinging, to your mm -hmm. point, in the wrong direction on. We have time for just one more question. I'm sorry, we'll, we'll take it quickly. Yeah. So I'm one of those well-intentioned males uh, walking <laughs> through the minefield. Uh, <laughs> Let's just give you a I'm also clumsy in a variety of ways. This is not, not the minefield part, but the well-intended man. <laughs> <laughs> So um, in my position, I'm in a leadership position, and I'm trying to set that correct culture. And I run into a situation that I've got a female on my team who's an absolute rock star, and I've got another person on my team who I'll call the um, poster <coughs> person of uh, uh, the all-star from high school, you know, the athlete and everything. Uh, and there the was bro? A, yeah, that's one. <laughs> the same. There, there is a situation that came up where, um, you know, she was offended by something. Uh, it was brought up to me, you know, I tried to get everyone together. It's like, hey, let's get in, t in the room together and kind of talk through it because this is an opportunity to talk about something that's very important. And then she backed away into the shadow and said, oh, I don't really, I really don't want to do that. Um, so how can I or anybody else model a behavior? Because if, if something is inappropriate and zero tolerance is only zero tolerance if it never happens, how can I take the next step or help to create an environment to bring her? It's like, look, no, it's, your opinion is absolutely as important as his opinion. You have an equal right to be safe here. But when it came time for us to actually, and we, it wasn't an action, it was just a discussion. It's like, oh, no, I don't want to be known as that person. What right. can I do to she help? She doesn't want to be known as that woman. And, and because she didn't feel like it was that safe, because this happens all the time, and women feel as, especially if they're, not in upper management, right? If they still are trying to work their way up, they feel as though the ramifications of complaining or of, of coming out with something like that are so bad and will, nobody will want to bring them onto their team. Nobody will promote them. I, I would do the anonymous thing and don't do it in your staff meeting because then they'll all guess who the one woman is, right? I would wait till I had a big meeting like with hundreds, couple hundreds or, you know, the town hall or... Uh, you know, or, or even at a, lar a large constituency, and then I would bring it up without, I would bring up the scenario without Never the heard. names and just say, you know, hey, I heard this at a meeting I went to at VMware, and here's a scenario. What do you guys think about it? Thank you so it, much. I don't know if that's that an amber alert or it's a time's, time's up. It's a dust storm. <laughs> oh, a dust storm. I cut the Texas waters are getting us here. <laughs> um, thank you very much. Dirk, Julie, Kathy, thank you so much Robin. for this. Thank really appreciate you. it. Thank you. Congratulations. Good for you. You're thank a role you. model, man. I, I just want to take a moment um, to, to thank all of you for coming here, in addition to Nithya. Um, very powerful conversation. I want to thank you very much. Um, the importance of continuing to work on these challenges um, and to tackle them uh, and to talk about them in your various arenas, which were really interesting, um, is so critical. So I just want to thank you and I want to thank everyone here for attending this session, taking time out from VMworld, VMworld 2017 to come have this conversation with us. Just quickly, there is going to be a private reception after this as part of the party tonight. If you're interested in joining that, there are wristbands at the back of the room. There will be signage as you head over to the larger party. Um, and we'll be there, and we can continue the conversation. But with that, thank you so much for coming, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.